Welcome to the uh, present session. I'm pleased to present Lucas Riepel and Fanny Bialik. Lucas is the David and Michelle Ebersman Assistant Professor of History at Brown. His concept will be nature. He's currently working on a book manuscript called Assembling the Dinosaur Science Museums in American Capitalism. Fanny Bialik is a visiting assistant professor in religious studies at Brown. Her concept will be indeterminacy. And she has just completed a dissertation called Vulnerability and Its Power, Recognition, Response, and the Problem of Valorization. Lucas will start us off with nature. Thank you, Stephen, um, and thanks everyone for coming and also for the invitation to present. So I'm going to start by apologizing <laughs> um, because this, um, my paper is um, um, far too long to read the whole thing. So what I'll do instead uh, is read the introductory section and then um, uh, try to uh, kind of ad lib the, most of the middle of the paper and then read the concluding section again. Um, uh, so as uh, Stephen mentioned, my concept is nature. And uh, it might seem uh, that nature would be an unlikely choice uh, uh, for a conference devoted to political concepts. Uh, that is because for many of us, I suspect, the word conjures up something like a mental image of wilderness, uh, rugged and sometimes forbidding landscapes, like, uh, for example, the Badlands of South Dakota, uh, or Yellowstone, or something of that sort. Uh, the concept thus invites a kind of spatial analysis, signifying something like a zone of human exclusion, uh, to borrow an evocative phrase from Peter Gallison. Uh, and therefore, insofar as it explicitly invokes the non-human, an argument could be made that nature may rank among the least political of all concepts. Of course, to insist that nature is apolitical is already to indicate why it plays such a powerful role in political discourse. Nature's claim to reside outside or perhaps even above politics endows it with enormous, enormous moral authority, which is exactly why it is so often invoked in the service of, of overtly political aims. Often appeals to the natural tend to align with a conservative agenda in the broadest sense of that word, tending to figure in explanations of the way things are rather than imaginative speculations about the way they could be. In recent debates about the legality of same-sex marriage, for example, the concept of nature has been invoked to defend traditional gender roles, family structure, and kinship relationships. Similarly, Adam Smith's well-known dictum that nature has endowed mankind with an innate propensity to, quote, truck, barter, uh, and exchange has rightly been critiqued as a way of making specific regimes of economic production and social organization that elevate the marketplace to a central and privileged place in all human affairs seem inevitable. For that reason, the concept of nature is often viewed with suspicion by those who are weary of the way that it, that it appears to embody a kind of Panglossian optimism. The view that everything is for the best way that it is, so, excuse me, the view that everything is for the best the way that it is, and that things are thus just as they should be. Despite these concerns, recent years have seen an upswell of interest in the concept of nature among scholars in the humanities and interpretive social sciences. At a time of considerable distress about the fate of our planet, a deeper and more sustained attention to the natural world seems more pressing now than it has in recent memory. Historians, for example, have embraced, have embraced the relatively new field of environmental history, which has grown quickly from an initially small group of scholars uh, who insisted that one cannot properly understand human history by cleaving it from natural history. Similarly, eco-criticism, animal studies, multi-species ethnography, and other approaches that seek to, seek to bring the critical and, and interpretive tools of the humanities into dialogue with the natural sciences are now thriving. Indeed, even the anthropologist Bruno Latour has recently chosen to promote what he calls his diplomatic metaphysics by describing it as an ecologizing rather than modernizing project. Whereas the latter sought to impose a sharp separation between facts and values, humans and non-humans, nature and society, the former, that is, his ecologizing metaphysics, uh, hopes, uh, uh, he, he hopes might, quote, make it possible to bring a larger number of values into cohabitation within a somewhat richer ecosystem, end quote. For Latour, as well as for so many others, the need to revisit, rethink, and reimagine our relationship to the natural world derives much of its urgency from the specter of uh, climate change. 
As it is often said, we live at a time when our own species has become so powerful that it now qualifies as a genuine force of nature in its own right. By implication, our greatest challenge is no longer simply to understand the world around us, but rather to shape it in ways that will allow us to flourish rather than rendering the globe uninhabitable. Latour therefore concludes that, quote, if geologists themselves see humanity as a force of the same amplitude as volcanoes or even plate tectonics, one thing is now certain. We have no hope whatsoever of seeing a definitive distinction between science and politics, end quote. On this view, nature and culture are fundamentally of a piece with one another insofar as both involve not only active representation, but also, and perhaps even more crucially, deliberate and powerful means of intervention. What is interesting is that Latour is joined in the same sentiment by many prominent members of the scientific community themselves. For example, the recent and much talked about proposal that we formally recognize a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, is motivated by analogous concerns about our immense power and control over the world as a whole. As Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stromer argued in the IGBP newsletter several decades ago, uh, now several decades ago, the expansion of our own species has been so, quote, astounding that it seems to us more than appropriate to emphasize the central role of mankind in ecology and geology. More recently, uh, Crutzen was joined by Will Steffens and John McNeil in making the connection even more explicit, stating that humans have evolved into, quote, a global geophysical force. Although these authors admit that our species has always left a mark on its local surroundings, they nonetheless insist that, quote, pre-industrial humans did not have the technological or organizational capacities to match or dominate the great forces of nature. All that has now changed, however, necessitating a recognition that, quote, the Earth has left its natural geological epoch and entered the Anthropocene. Let me say that again, because I think it's such a remarkable thing to say. The Earth has left its natural geological epoch and entered the Anthropocene. Right? <clears throat> so similar notions were recently echoed by the postcolonial scholar Dipesh Chakrabarty as well. Writing in the pages of Critical Inquiry, Critical Inquiry Chakrabarty laments how, quote, humans now wield a geological force which rivals in power the massive asteroid whose impact led to the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs. And I quote, to call ourselves geological agents is to attribute to us a force on the same scale as that released at other times when there has been a mass extinction of species. Given this formulation, it is somewhat ironic that Chakrabarty goes on to urge his colleagues to abandon traditional modes of critical analysis that seek to understand human society through the language of power. In the age of the Anthropocene, we are told, traditional Marxian politics have lost their critical edge because the consequences of global climate change impact all of us, regardless of race, class, or gender identity. Quote, unlike the crises of capitalism, there are no lifeboats here for the rich and the privileged. Chakrabarty thus calls on us to engage in a form of what he calls species thinking that will make it possible to reimagine our history as that of a, quote, human collectivity in us. Now, although they differ on many important issues, it is noteworthy how much all of these authors agree that a defining feature of the Anthropocene is humanity's almost limitless power. In particular, I find it striking, to say the least, that Crutzen and Chakrabarty, as well as Latour and so many others, appear to embrace the historiographical rubric patterned upon a continued expansion of humanity's capacity to intervene in and shape the world after its own image, until such a time that our species must finally face the possibility of its own collapse and annihilation. In contrast, I would like to ask if it does not make more sense, both in point of empirical fact, as well as in hopes of forging a more sustainable politics, that we strive to accept precisely the opposite, namely an acknowledgement of our own species' lack of power, emphasizing its frailty, its ignorance, and its impotence. After all, what does the specter of climate change represent if not a failure to exercise deliberate and willful control? both of the world around us, and perhaps even more significantly, of ourselves and each other. In the final analysis, it is not some abstract geological force that will ultimately be responsible for our undoing, but rather our own actions, or more precisely, our collective inactions. In what follows, I would therefore like to explore another conceptual avenue, one that might offer some additional resources for thinking about our relationship to the rest of the world. In particular, I'm interested in examining the concept of nature's shifting, unstable, and complex history in hopes of articulating a different way forward than the one that so many recent discussions of the Anthropocene seem to presuppose. In so doing, I'd like to redirect Latour's suggestion that we complicate, if not collapse, the distinction between nature and culture, science and politics, by emphasizing a somewhat different historical register, 
That is, rather than rendering nature as a political concept by emphasizing our power to intervene in it, I would like to suggest an alternative way to experience nature, one that involves confronting the limits of our own power and influence. Nature, I'd like to suggest, may therefore be understood as an encounter with events and circumstances beyond our control. As we shall see, it may ultimately also be about our inability to influence one another. Thus, if the concept of the political is, about, is fundamentally about power, I propose that we conceptualize nature to be about its exact opposite, a concept that invokes human frailty, weakness, and impotence. It is conventional to contrast nature from culture, but rarely do we articulate what this distinction is supposed to consist of. The Oxford English Dictionary provides some fascinating clues about the history of both words. For example, we learn that the word nature derives from an Anglo-Norman word for a, quote, active force that establishes and maintains the order of the universe. We might say, then, that nature consists of that which shapes the material world within which we live. But the picture is complicated somewhat by the fact that we too have a nature, for the OED informs us that the Latin word natura referred not just to the creative power organizing the world, but also more specifically to the generative capacities of our own bodies, quote, birth, constitution, character, and especially the genitals. In contrast, the word culture derives from an Anglo-Norman word for uh, the, quote, action of cultivating the land, plants, etc., as well as the practice of animal husbandry. Over time, it also came to be used as, one of, uh, as a way to talk about a person's development, especially the cultivation of one's linguistic and artistic faculties. In this, the English word again follows its Latin counterpart, cultura, which referred chiefly to farming practices, such as tilling the soil or caring for plants and animals, as well as the, quote, training or improvement of the faculties. As this brief etymological excursion suggests, the nature-culture divide therefore cannot simply be mapped onto a human-non-human -human dichotomy. Our language recognizes both human nature and agriculture, and neither involve a distant or strained metaphor. Rather, both expressions seem to represent something very near the core meaning of both terms. The difference between nature and culture thus appears to invoke what we can and cannot bend to our will. Whereas the word culture is primarily about the act of cultivation, a kind of rearing or shaping to meet some deliberate and often refined end, the word nature is used to describe the, quote, inherent or essential quality or constitution of a thing, meaning those aspects that we cannot change. When speaking about our own species, the word nature therefore refers, refers to one's innate character or more fully to the basic disposition of mankind. Often, it, it specifically signifies our moral and personal failings, as in the appeal to one's worst or base nature. This helps to explain why the phrase human nature is so often invoked to excuse behaviors that we find objectionable, implicitly claiming they, that they are inevitable, uh, an inevitable, if also an enviable, fact of life. It also helps to explain the idiomatic expression of doing one's nature or heeding nature's call, which of course refers to the elimination of excrement. <laughs> in this context, it is interesting to consider, if only for a moment, the garden. Going back to classical antiquity and in sharp contrast to our own time, gardens were not places one went to experience or languish in nature. On the contrary, gardens were primarily seen as a place of escape from the dangers that lurk in the unfamiliar and the unknown. During the Re European Renaissance, gardens therefore evolved into hugely ambitious, inordinately expensive, and elaborately designed spaces that were often fenced in by a forbidding enclosure. Moreover, they tended to be full of ornament, architecture, and other products of human artifice, especially sculptures, fountains, and statuary. Finally, it was crucial that plants in the garden be carefully manicured in accordance with elaborate geometrical schemes. Taken together, these features were all carefully calibrated to appeal to our ocular and olfactory senses, whereas the wilderness that lay just beyond was seen as an unpre unpredictable and dangerous place. This is perhaps most clearly expressed in the Judeo-Christian tradition of using the word paradise, which derives from the Persian word for a, quote, enclosed park, orchard, or pleasure ground, to refer to the biblical Garden of Eden. Having eaten from the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve were literally expelled from the garden and thrown into a world full of death decay, pain, and suffering, in a word, nature. For much of European history, then, the concept of nature had a rather different normative valence than it does now. In our own time, the adjective natural is frequently used to describe things that are healthy, wholesome, and otherwise good. In contrast, an earlier period tended to view the state of nature as something that had to be overcome. This is perhaps most clearly brought out in the work of early modern political philosophers, such as Thomas Hobbes, uh, as well as John Locke. <clears throat> 
Although Leviathan was primarily concerned with the relationships between human beings themselves, Hobbes nonetheless had a great deal to say about uh, life in a state of nature. Most no noteworthy is that he did not so much fear nature because it involved an exposure to the elements so much as an exposure to ourselves and each other. At one point, for example, he, he warned that, quote, nature has the power to disassociate and render men apart, uh, excuse me, to disassociate and render men apt to invade and to destroy one another. Absent a recognized sovereign strong enough to cultivate and enforce the laws of civil society, he reasoned, uh, we would be doomed to, quote, that condition which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. In such a condition, Hobbes went on to write, there is no place for industry, because the fruits thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth. Hence, he famously concluded that life in a state of nature is, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay, so I'll stop there and sort of skip forward, but in the longer paper, I sort of go on to talk a little bit, uh, a bit about John Locke, who of course also had lots of things to say about uh, the state of nature, and then to kind of discuss ideas about nature uh, as they're expressed in um, uh, kind of canonical uh, works of English dramaturgy, particularly uh, Shakespeare's play King Lear, as well as The Temp Tempest, and also in some 19th century literature like Frankenstein. Uh, the point of all of which is to say that these ideas that an encounter with nature is an encounter uh, uh, with that which is beyond our control uh, sort of run, uh, show up in lots of places in kind of uh, English, uh, uh, Anglo, uh, kind of tr the English language tradition. Uh, but that also there's a kind of interesting uh, sort of complication, right, that we, that we encounter when we start thinking about where we draw the, the, uh, the boundaries around the natural, which is that, of course, as the uh, practice of what used to be called natural philosophy and what now is called science uh, uh, kind of expand in the period after, during and after the European Renaissance, uh, humanity's ability to kind of control and, and exercise power over and intervene in, in, the phys in their physical surroundings uh, uh, kind of increases dramatically. And as this happens, uh, our ideas about what the bounds of the natural are shift pretty dramatically. And of course, in many ways, we can think of um, uh, the uh, novel uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, along these lines, but you can also think of The Tempest along these lines, right? Prospero, uh, the, arguably the main character of The Tempest, is a magi, someone who practices natural magic, which is uh, kind of, which you can think of as a kind of form of natural philosophy. And then in the paper I sort of talk a bit more about um, the concept of nature in, in more modern uh, American society, looking in particular at, at intellectual property law, the patent law in, in particular. Uh, the reason being that there's a kind of interesting expansion that has taken place in the last 150 years or so of our ability to own various parts of, of the world, in particular um, our ability to own things like organisms, right, to, um, genetically modified organisms in particular. Uh, but if you look, and, and what is ownership, right, if not an assertion of control, right? Ownership is, uh, the act of owner, which we've heard a, a great deal about in the previous session, right, the act of ownership is uh, uh, an act of enlisting the state uh, in defending our decisional authority over uh, certain objects. And what's interesting is if you look at the kind of evolution of patent law in uh, the American legal system over the last 150 years or so, um, uh, there is a kind of tradition that's developed uh, uh, of uh, asserting that what are, and this is explicitly cited as such in the patent law, asserting that what are called products of nature are not uh, quote unquote patent eligible subject matter, which is to say that uh, as a, um, a famous Supreme Court decision from the early 20th century argued, uh, it's not, it shouldn't be possible to assert ownership over uh, the sun, right, the, the heat of the sun, the power of electricity, uh, or other products of nature, right? The idea is that only things that have somehow been manufactured by humans, right, things that are not, and here again, quoting the, the court's language, things that are not nature's own handiwork uh, are patent eligible subject matter. But interestingly, the last few years have, have not only seen more and more things being taken out of the state of nature and placed into uh, uh, civil society through, through the patent law, but also some you sometimes see the kind of opposite happening as well, where things that used to be patentable el eligible subject matter are placed back into a state of nature. The most, uh, maybe most interesting ver uh, version of this happening uh, recently was uh, a tw 2013 Supreme Court decision uh, in which it was ruled that um, uh, DNA, sequenced, uh, DNA sequences are not patentable eligible subject matter because they are uh, products of nature. What's interesting here is that for about the 
previous two decades, it was possible to patent DNA sequences, uh, and that's now no longer the case. So it's so not right. So the claim is that as science and technology have grown, more and more things have been taken out of a state of nature uh, as we've been able to exercise more and more control over them. But at the same time, the opposite can happen as well, right? Certain kinds of uh, um, technological and scientific practices come to seem so mundane that they no longer uh, seem to be a kind of sufficiently uh, uh, far-reaching intervention to qualify as a um, uh, to qualify as a human invention, and therefore something that can be uh, um, uh, something over which uh, uh, intellectual property can be asserted. Okay, so um, so that's kind. Of, and then I also have a sort of a, a brief section where I talk about. Um, so speaking of ruins, I talk about um, romantic kind of conceptions of. Uh, the romantic sort of celebrations, in fact, of a state of nature kind of overtaking civil society. Uh, um, and there's many, many examples of these. But in the, in the paper, I sort of look very briefly at landscape paintings. And there's very famous landscape paintings, including by the Hudson River School, but also the painting of the Louvre that was referred to in the previous session, where uh, there's a kind of deliberate exercise of the imagination, imagining what, um, uh, what our society will look like once it has been overtaken uh, by nature once again. Okay, so to return to, the, to the, 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 the paper itself. So by way of conclusion, I'd like to offer just a few thoughts about the way these reflections might help us to think through the challenge that, challenges that we face in the present. Although characteristically 19th century fears, this is referring to these romantic discussions, although character, characteristically 19th century fears that a so-called civilizing process leads to a decadent culture that inevitably enters a period of decline may seem like the distant prejudice of a bygone age, I would nonetheless like to draw a parallel between these outmoded anxieties and our modern obsession with global climate change, biodiversity loss, and other expressions of environmental degradation. Both are declension narratives that center on our excessive confidence in the ability to control our own destiny. And as such, they reveal that our relationship to nature is no less fraught than it was during the Romantic era, even if that is true for different reasons. Whereas Romantics both dreaded, yet also somehow welcomed the day when nature would finally reconquer the globe and lay waste to civil society, we fear that our own species may have so fully uh, mastered the natural world that the latter can no longer support us. The dominant narrative of the Anthropocene is written in the style of a tragedy. It treats Homo sapiens as a protagonist whose power has grown to such, a, to such an extent that we stand on the brink of rendering the whole earth uninhabitable. Would another narrative, composed in a more ironic register, not be more useful? Rather than viewing ourselves as having overpowered nature to the point where it totally disappears, I would like to urge a view of the Anthropocene as a time in which our species is once again confronting the limits of its own power. Such a perspective not only rightly points out that the problems we currently face are primarily political, although they do have disastrous ecological consequences. It also suggests that, that it would be foolish for us to try and strong arm our way out of the crisis that we currently face. What is now needed, I want to insist, is not for our species to exert even greater control. Rather, I would urge us to develop an understanding of ourselves built on humility, one that will allow us to reconcile ourselves with the limits of our own power to exercise willful and deliberate control. As I've been at pains to point out, there is a long history of thinking about the concept of nature along precisely these lines. Indeed, despite the tremendous control that modern society and technology affords us, the notion that our experience of nature represents a confrontation with that which, is, which we cannot simply bend to our will continues to inform at least some of our uh, institutions into the present day, including the juridical discourse of intellectual property law. That said, it is also true that a reading of the concept of nature, such as the one I've tried to suggest, leads to some rather unintuitive consequences. For example, it may be objected that what is, uh, uh, it may be objected that it is common to confront something beyond our control without necessarily venturing into a context we would normally call nature. The value of our money, the location of our political borders, and many other examples of what Durkheim famously called social facts, all of these are largely beyond our individual control. This is true even though social facts are human institutions, a product of our collective actions, beliefs, and practices. There is no fact of the matter that determines the value of a dollar bill beyond what we all as a collective believe it to be, but I am not therefore in a position to influence it in any quantitatively meaningful sense. One way one might respond to this objection would be to distinguish between what we can and cannot control as individuals versus those things that are beyond our influence as a whole species or a population. 
Uh, but these unintuitive consequences may also be seen as a feature rather than a drawback of the reading I wish to endorse. It does not strike me as particularly far-fetched or wrong-headed to suggest that our experience in the face of particularly durable social realities differs so much from, say, that of confronting an imposing physical phenomenon that is difficult to control. After all, it is rarely much more... It, is it really so much more difficult to level a mountain, to irrigate a desert, or to take to the air than it would be to affect meaningful change in particularly entrenched and resilient institutions like modern capitalism, to take just one example? Of course, uh, all such experiences are highly variable and context-dependent. Thus, for example, my own experience of attempting to change the value of a dollar bill would almost certainly differ from that of a high-ranking official at the US Federal Reserve. But again, this variability and context dependence strikes me as entirely appropriate. For as we have seen, it also characterizes our encounters with more canonical and recognizable aspects of nature. Much like our experience of size is indexed to the space that our own bodies occupy, so too then is our experience of nature dependent on our means of interacting with and intervening in the rest of the world. The variable and deeply contextualized sense in which, I work, in which I urge that we understand nature leads to one final point on which I would like to end. Just as other organisms lead rich social lives, so too is it true that we are far from the only creatures that have altered their physical surroundings in deep, lasting, and far-reaching ways. To take just a single example, geochemists agree that for most of its history, the Earth's atmosphere was reducing and thus oxygen poor. It was only during the Proterozoic Aeon that a group of photosynthesizing prokaryotes called cyanobacteria began to change the composition of the Earth's atmosphere to a state that resembles our own. This was a monumental event, setting the stage for a rapid radiation of life forms known as the Cambrian Explosion, during which most extant animal phyla first appeared, including the chordates to which our own species belongs. But in an ironic twist, the photosynthetic activities of cyanobacteria not only created the geochemical conditions that first allowed complex animals to evolve, they also contributed to the Precambrian era's most violent mass extinction event, as the vast majority of obligate anaerobic organisms found themselves unable to adapt to the new atmospheric conditions. That's to say that as the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere increases, there's all sorts of organisms that have adapted to living in an oxygen-poor ecology, and those organisms then go extinct, right? Evolutionary biologists and ecologists would describe these events as an example of niche constructions, niche construction of organisms changing their surroundings in ways that profoundly alter the selection pressures shaping their own evolutionary trajectories. Other examples of niche construction include the production of copious leaf litter by angiosperms and the construction of complex mounds by termites, as well as anthropocentric climate change. For our purposes, we, ne we need not adopt the same terminology, but it is nonetheless worth pausing to consider what the biologists who introduced this concept into the technical literature meant when they claimed that their aim was nothing less than what they called a, quote, relativization of evolutionary biology. Citing the critical insight that biology's ubiquitous metaphor of adaptation should be replaced with a metaphor of construction, and that's their language, right? They talk about biology becoming kind of constructivist discipline. By the, uh, so this is an insight that they attribute to the well-known population geneticist Richard Lewins, uh, Richard Lewinton, the biologist who introduced niche construction into the uh, terminology, argue that, quote, niche construction changes the dynamic of the evolutionary process in fundamental ways because it precludes a description of evolutionary change relative only to autonomous environments. That is, it implies nothing less than a new conception of our ontology, one that is dynamic and integrated rather than static and disconnected. In much the same way as the biological notion of niche construction relativizes our understanding of an organism's relationship to its environment, I have tried to suggest that a political reading of nature might relativize the way that we understand our place in the world. However, in some ways, it has exactly the opposite consequences, whereas the orthodox view of evolutionary biology tends to overestimate the extent to which organisms are embedded within their environment, thereby discounting their power to actively shape and intervene in their ecological context. I have tried to suggest that our orthodox view of the Anthropocene tends to overstate our ability to exercise power and control over the rest of the world. It is for this reason that I want to resist the temptation of elevating our own species to the level of a geological force, Rather, we would do better to acknowledge our limits, moral, cognitive, and otherwise, as just one kind of organism among so many others. Thank you. So I have a handout to pass around.
So let me begin by echoing the thanks um, for being here to Adi and, and Tim and Bonnie um, and the Koga Center in general for hosting us. Um, my concept is indeterminacy. If you don't have the handout, that's okay for now. <laughs> In 1958, in Darmstadt and then in Brussels, John Cage gave two lectures titled Indeterminacy. The second was composed of 30 short stories, which is later expanded to 90, that's why you have numbers like 75 on the handout, um, which, that were each read by Cage in exactly one minute, though they vary significantly in their length on a page. In a recording of the lecture made the following year, Cage can be heard catching his breath after finishing runs through the longer stories, and trying with another kind of discomfort to extend his pace through the shorter ones. The pace has been approximated in printed versions of the story, some of which he laid out himself, some of which have been laid out later, through visual spaces in the text, as you can see on the handout. And so I'll read, though not across the full minute, the first example there. In Zen they say, if something is boring after two minutes, try it for four. If still boring, try it for eight, 16, 32, and so on eventually one discovers that it's not boring at all, but very interesting. Indeterminacy, Cage writes elsewhere, is the ability of a piece to be performed in substantially different ways. In many musical traditions, this is done by lengthening or shortening a piece, rearranging it into different tempos, but Cage's indeterminacy seems defined precisely by its temporal exaction, the predetermination of its duration. Each story is read in one minute, regardless of how long it might be, there is no allowance to take four minutes or eight or 16. If the story is boring after one, it's finished, and if it's interesting after one, Cage still moves on to the next. The minute is what's predetermined. The indeterminacy thus comes from elsewhere. We might think here as well of Cage's famous four minutes and 33 seconds in which only the duration of the piece is predetermined. This is the piece that is written as um, to last four minutes and 33 seconds, um, but for the orchestra not to play any, uh, any of their instruments. Varying the length, in other words, isn't what lets these pieces be performed in different ways, nor is indeterminacy the result of chance operations, like those Cage uses in other works, which introduce randomness in the composition by determining tempos and dynamics from the pages of an ancient Chinese text, for instance, or by throwing dice. These trans operations and these other works are performed at the time of the composition, while indeterminacy refers to the possibility of the performance, Cage writes, being determined differently, rendering chance operations and the composition unnecessary, as Cage says explicitly in the second lecture, and this is the second of the stories um, on your handout, number 20. Neither piece, he writes, of uh, two indeterminate works he's writing at the time, uses chance operations. The indeterminacy in the case of Music Walk is such that I cannot predict at all what will happen until it is performed. Chance operations are not necessary when the actions that are made are unknowing. He then goes on to describe the piece as a kind of geometric game consisting of nine sheets of paper having points and one without any. A smaller transparent plastic rectangle having five widely spaced parallel lines is placed over this in any position bringing some of the points out of potentiality and into activity. The lines are ambiguous, referring to five different categories of sound in any order. Additional small plastic squares are provided, having five non-parallel lines. If you're not following the visuality of this, that's okay. <laughs> the actions are important, um, more important. Um, which may or may not be used to make further determinations regarding the nature of the sounds to be produced. Playing positions are several, at the keyboard, at the back of the piano, at a radio. One moves at any time from one to another of these positions, changing thereby the reference of the points to the parallel lines. One moves at any time in a way that determines the way the piece is performed, though it is also the piece itself in the transparent plastic rectangle placed over the sheets of paper that brings some of the points of potentiality into activity. Some pieces may or may not be used, though the choices made are not the full determination of the piece either, but rather unknowing actions, in Cage's words, a word he repeats through many of the um, stories. The performer acts to determine the piece, in other words, by choosing at times to move in certain ways or use certain parts, but also the performer himself cannot predict at all what will happen until it is performed. 
This is not because of some element of chance, some randomness in the arrangement, but because of an indeterminacy or but the indeterminacy or unpredictability is instead a result of the performer's determinations having consequences, Cage seems to say, during the performance that are not known ahead of time or are at least not predetermined ahead of time. Its indeterminacy, in other words, comes in the fact that it could happen differently, not in the fact that it will or that it must. Because it could happen differently, though, it, cannot, it can only be determined in the performance. There's no predetermination nor simple chance, but determination in the duration of the time. Hence, the minutes of indeterminacy are indeterminate until performed, despite their specified duration and even the predetermination of the story to be told. The fact that these are written down on paper doesn't seem to affect the indeterminacy. As the story is performed, in other words, it could happen differently with different pacing, different sounds, different pauses, and so on. The piece requires a performer to determine the minute in each minute. The minute could have been different, it could have happened differently. The period of time is predetermined, but not everything about how that time will be spent. I want to think today about how Cage's connection between indeterminacy and duration might offer an insight into a critical page or maybe a volume of our political lexicon, one that begins with anticipation and includes insecurity, probability, and vulnerability, ending just short of the full alphabet with questions of what happens next. These words allow us to determine our time with predictions and preparations, efforts to predetermine what could, of course, happen differently. Indeed, they might even suggest that because things could happen differently, we have some obligation to try to make them happen better. In this mode, they offer some of the most critical imperatives of politics, to prepare for what is to come, to protect against potential dangers, to seek a better future than what we have at present, or to try to prevent things, at least, from getting any worse. They also encourage some of the most violent imperatives, to neutralize potential threats, to preempt violence with sometimes greater violence, and to protect ourselves and each other in increasingly diminishing, dominative, and fearsome ways. These are the words that authorize preemptive strikes and orders to shelter in place, as well as infrastructure improvements before bridges fall down. They make us nervous, fearful, and cautious in good ways and bad, in other words, and they describe these feelings to better and worse effect. They keep us from actions that might be worthwhile, and they prompt action that may show itself to be worthwhile as well, or sometimes deeply destructive, and sometimes some combination of the two. I think one could make the argument that much of politics is defined by indeterminacy in the sense, by the anticipation of what is to come, the perception of what we are vulnerable to or well prepared for, and the attendant imperatives to prepare further or differently based on these judgments so that we might determine our conditions differently as the time comes. These terms all refer to the indeterminacy of the future and the idea that I think is cages, that it might happen differently, that it's, that it's happening as a product of, in part of our determinations and not just the operations of chance. They refer to the idea that we can do something about the future precisely because it could all happen differently, precisely because perhaps the piece could be performed in substantially different ways. I think to refer to my, uh, the discussion we were just having, that this is actually Hobbes's politics in the Leviathan, a politics of vulnerability and anticipation driven by the desire to determine encounters with others in your favor before they can be determined to your detriment. For Hobbes, every encounter presents an opportunity for the other to strike, and thus requires preemptive strikes to secure oneself against their threat. Anticipating the other's strike creates a responsibility to secure oneself by immobilizing the other. As he writes, and this is in the passages on the state of nature, not yet in the liberalism sections, there is no way for, men to for man to secure himself so reasonable as anticipation. That is, by force or wiles to master the persons of all men he can, so long till he see no other power greater, great enough to endanger him. With such anticipation, men have no pleasure, but on the contrary, a great deal of grief in keeping company. To be with others is to fight and defeat them before they can do the same to you. The indeterminacy of what they might do thus begs determination in debilitating blows. Hobbes's conception of the subject restlessly seeking security from indeterminacy in this sense is predicated on a radical vision of equality to kill, and thus equality of vulnerability. 
in which even the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest, propelling the perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. So between the two of us, we'll quote all the most famous passages of Hobbes, but (laughs) there's no one sufficiently weak, but I think none overlapping, interesting. Um, There's no one sufficiently weak that I need not fear them at all, in other words. I can only win a fight, dominating the other, to achieve the invulnerability to them that keeps indeterminacy within livable bounds. This idea of the equal ability to kill, and thus an equal vulnerability to others on this axis, implies an important symmetry in encounters with others when they occur. I meet the other knowing that they are as able to kill me as I am them, until one of us has defeated the other, killing or dominating him or her, and thus determining the vulnerability shared between us, we must anticipate the other's strike at any moment. This uncomfortable state of indeterminacy propels violence to determine its end, relieving the tension of the encounter by realizing either my vulnerability or the other's. The Hobbesian picture seems animated then by the constant anticipation of determination, of my vulnerability to you or yours to me, which can be determined only in the doing, in the realization of one or the other in wounds that prevent further threats until he sees no other power great enough to endanger him. Ultimately, Hobbes argues this begs the determination of all encounters into the liberal state, rewriting the piece entirely such that its indeterminacy is performed by other actors across a different duration and with a different set of reference points altogether. But it emerges, I want to emphasize, from grappling with indeterminacy in the form of insecurity, from seeking a determination that relieves its tension. What the Hobbesian wants, classically, is security, a lack of indeterminacy in a critical sense because the relations of power and vulnerability have all already been determined. It isn't obvious from the history of Hobbes' reception that this is a point about time and duration of indeterminacy. It's more often made as a point about security and vulnerability, about the equality of persons and the nature of persons to be violent. But I think there's something worthwhile in recovering Hobbes' interest in time, and thus his engagement with insecurity as a kind of cage-like indeterminacy, cage in the capital C sense, of how the piece will play out. I began with cage because I want to suggest that the conception of duration and of a piece at all is critical to the way we let indeterminacy determine politics. But I want to argue that it's a mistake to imagine politics as a fixed duration, to be determined within that time, like in a cage composition, instead of conceiving its continuation in indeterminacy over time, conceived indeterminately in turn. Politics, in other words, is not four minutes and 33 seconds, but of indeterminate duration as well as indeterminate composition. The piece can be performed in substantially different ways, but there also isn't a piece to be performed at all. Anticipation, preparation, and considerations of what happens next should not organize the future too quickly into defined periods of indeterminacy that need only be determined in the right way. They should not foreclose possibilities in the future beyond any given minute, or four minutes, or 16, nor should they allow a false understanding of fixed duration, even only by analogy, to determine the way that we perform. Recent attention to vulnerability and anticipatory violence, particularly in the context of terror, seem, I think, to be making this mistake, perhaps precisely from a misreading of Hobbes or maybe an ordinary reading of Hobbes as a theorist of anticipatory violence. Adriana Cavrero and Judith Butler, among others, have sought to argue that the rush to violence in response to contemporary terrorism, have sought to argue against the rush to violence in response to contemporary terrorism by questioning its conceptions of anticipation and vulnerability more broadly, the demands they make and the responsibilities that they might imply. Cavrero in particular has elevated vulnerability as a condition to be determined in care against the conception, which she traces to Hobbes, that it must always be determined in violence, wounding the other so that he or she cannot wound you. I agree with Cavrero that vulnerability should not always be preempted with violence, but I think its preemptive determination and care bear somewhat similar problems of domination, debilitation, and diminishment that shouldn't be dismissed as the lesser of necessary evils. In this way, Cavrero's proposal to determine vulnerability and care makes a mistake of the duration of vulnerability, I want to argue, misunderstanding the indeterminacy of our conditions as something like Cage's indeterminate pieces, instead of an indeterminacy that extends indeterminately itself. In her 2009 book, Horrorism, Cavrero proposes that the language of terror participates in the logic of its perpetrators by feeding its physics of frantic anticipation and strategic determination and violence. 
By design, terror continuously catches those who try to prepare for it by surprise, and it often seems to seek this effect more than any particular destruction or scale of impact. It manipulates our experience of vulnerability and even employs it as an instrument for its perpetuation, in part through an escape of the language we have to anticipate and prepare for it, or so her argument goes. In response, Cabrera wants to name it, giving it language that might help us escape its terror in these ways. The name she offers, horrorism, seeks to attend to the bodies of its victims instead of the persistent capacities of its perpetrators, and thus to the critical tasks of care for the wounded and mourning of the dead, instead of the strategies of prevention and preparation that have dominated political responses to terror in recent decades. When the victims or victims' bodies determine the vocabulary of violence, she writes, violence becomes an occasion to discuss wounds and our vulnerability to wounding outside of a cycle of strategy and politics, or at least with some perspective on that cycle, instead of only from within it. Strategy begins to fall away, and the horror of violence emerges. If we observe the scene of massacre from the point of view of the helpless victims rather than that of the warriors, she says, the picture changes, the ends melt away, and the means become substance. More than terror, what stands out is horror. Cabrera's reframing of terror in terms of horror seeks to circumvent strategic thinking insofar as it casts vulnerable bodies as pieces in a larger game. Vulnerability need not be an advantage or disadvantage in a larger struggle, in other words, and our analysis of vulnerability need not be about increasing the vulnerability of our enemies or defeating them entirely to decrease our vulner own vulnerability to their attacks. This is a Hobbesian argument somewhat in the way Dick Cheney is a Machiavelli Machiavellian political operative, I think. It might be more by reputation than by intellectual precision, um, but I think the contours of the approach are really the same. By making the wound the substance instead of the means to other ends, Cavarero argues, vulnerability becomes a question of individual susceptibility in relation to the individual, not in relation to the other. Wounds are about the bodies they affect or destroy. Vulnerability is about the life it helps to define. I am a vulnerable being not only in relation to particular threats, my vulnerability is thus not eradicable by defeating any particular threat, nor should it be defined by that possibility. Drawing on Hannah Arendt, then, Cavrero suggests that, the vulner that vulnerability might now be seen to be about uniqueness, one derived in relations with others but not absorbed into these relations in defensive opposition. Rather, following Arendt, everyone is unique because exposing herself to others and consigning her singularity to this exposure, Cavrero writes, she shows herself such. We appear before others as ourselves, or for clarity, I might say, I appear before others as myself. Their recognition of me as a singular particular person, this person and not another, reveals and constitutes my uniqueness. And thus, Cabrera concludes, I consign my singularity to this exposure, and that it is in my appearance before others as myself that I am singularly, particularly me. In this way, Cabrera contends, this unique being is vulnerable by definition, constituted in relation to others, and thus vulnerable to their actions, inaction, misrecognition, and more. The paradigmatic example of the connection between vulnerability and uniqueness in Arendt's sense is natality, the arrival of the infant on the scene, or what Cavrero prefers to describe as the scene of mother and infant together. The infant is absolutely exposed, unilaterally in the sense that the infant has no, possible, no possibility of self-defense or even self-care. Instead, the infant relies on others for care as well as a lack of harm, and in this way, the newborn infant is not a combatant. Thus, the subject who encounters the infant, the mother, paradigmatically, cannot begin the Hobbesian terroristic cycle of insecurity, anticipation, and violence. Instead, the thematization of infancy, Cavrera writes, allows the vulnerable being to be read in terms of a drastic alternative between violence and care, the essential alternative inscribed in the condition of vulnerability. The infant's vulnerability provokes only the anticipation of how the infant could be harmed and not any potential harm the infant could inflict. The infant's vulnerability must then be determined in care, she argues, instead of violence, because even a lack of care would be a form of violence. Cavero argues that this, this is the alternative and imperative that all vulnerability presents, and that, the vulnerabil and that vulnerability must be re-thematized in our discussions about terroristic violence as the vulnerability of the exposed unique being instead of the potential combatant. Thus, vulnerability demands care instead of debilitating violence because it appears as helplessness and a request for relation instead of a threat to one's own unique integrity. 
In this way, Cabrera's effort to reframe discussions of vulnerability and anticipatory violence, I want to suggest, seeks a different determination of the encounters Hobbes determines in protective preemptive violence. But both accounts expect determinations of a kind that end determinacy, indeterminacy, or at least both frame the demands of indeterminacy in preemptive violence or care as the right determinations of it. Cabrera has little to say about what happens beyond the response of care or how care is determined. The possibility of violent determination is imminent, and so the potential caregiver must act, must respond, must determine the condition and care lest it be determined otherwise. And there's a kind of urgency to her writing on this that sets all of these questions about how it's done aside. The clock, in other words, seems to be ticking, so whatever story appears to them on the page should be read in whatever way necessary to determine in the minute they have. There isn't space or time for a negotiation over how best to care or the nature of either party's vulnerability, nor is there an apparent time for recourse or other responses to the care provided. Paternalism over protection and other forms of domination and care thus seem to loom over Cavarro's proposal, which simply revises what kind of determination is demanded by a Hobbesian picture instead of revising its structure of unilateral determination altogether. Instead of recovering the determination of vulnerability and care, I think that Cavarro's critique should be pursued by recovering the indeterminacy of vulnerability, and with it the indeterminacy of political conditions defined in these terms more generally. Instead of conceiving of vulnerability as a piece to be performed in the right determination, it might thus emerge as an invitation to negotiate, contest, anticipate, and respond to determinations and potential determinations in turn. If the problem both Hobbes and Cabrero seek to solve is the indeterminacy of vulnerability, the feeling that it could always be determined in better and worse ways, and if the problem that with Hobbes' solution is the violence and finality of its determinations, undermining the problem requires an embrace of indeterminacy instead of a different determination. A politics of indeterminacy in this way may include substantial determinations in care, but it doesn't exclude their negotiation and contestation by the parties involved, as Cavarero fails to discuss, and I think seems to exclude in her construction, which I could discuss further in a, in a longer version of this. I think, however, that this would be less a rejection of Hobbes than a critical return to his initial account of insecurity, indeterminacy, and vulnerability. Hobbes describes the war of all against all in terms of the duration of time in which it is po impossible to spend time together, a period that must end or be ended, such that we can have company in the indeterminate time in peace, of peace. This is the last um, quote on the handout. It's one that is very rarely cited in Hobbes, possibly one of the least rare, judging from Google book searches, which I think is pretty interesting on its own. Hereby, it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. For war consisteth not in battle only or the act of fighting, but in a tract of time wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. Sorry. Um, and therefore the notion of time is to be considered in the nature of war, as it is in the nature of weather. For as the nature of foul weather lieth not in a shower or two of rain, but in an inclination thereto of many days together, so the nature of war consisteth not in actual fighting, but in the known disposition thereto. During all the time, there is no assurance to the contrary. All other time is peace. I think we might read Hobbes here to desire not the domination of others, or not just the domination of others, we should probably say, but the ability to spend indeterminate time with one another without its impending determination in violence. In this way, I wonder if he isn't asking for a different inclination, not of determinations in care, but of indeterminacy itself. The allowance that not all will or must be determined, and the creation of space and time for further determination of any given indeterminacy. I don't want to rescue Hobbes' proposal for how to achieve this, but I want to recover the impulse as one toward indeterminate relations with others, away from rushes to determine in either violence or care. We might thus be reoriented, I think, from response in Cavarero's case and preemption in something like the um, modern state's project against terrorism to something more like negotiation or the space within the duration of an indeterminate peace. 
Politics need not be a performance with an end, in other words, or an endless series of pieces conceived the same way, but an extended practice of determining and determinacies in the performance. We need not request more time, in other words, since it always comes anyway. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> we have about 45 minutes uh, for question and answer, so I'll see three hands, four hands. I'll just uh, I'll keep the cue and nod at you and, and, uh, and uh, you put your hand down. When I do, and Tal, why don't you go ahead and start us? Great. So thank you for two fantastic papers, and I just, it was remarkable how well they went together. Um, yeah. Really worked very nicely. Um, I, my question, I have questions for both of you, but I'm very interrelated, and I want to start um, with Lucas. As I was hearing you talk about a kind of embrace of what we can't do, the recognition of a certain kind of humility and so forth, Augustine immediately came to mind. And there's a way in which Augustine is also responding to the collapse of a certain kind of empire and a sense of infinitude um, and impotence. And in Augustine's case, though, there's a sense in which God comes in offering grace, maybe not to save the day in conventional terms, but as part of the larger, um, the larger theodicy, one might say, right? And my question is, is there any equivalent or parallel to something like grace or a um, other kind of sanctification or um, anything of that sort in your picture? And if not, how is it different from a kind of just resignation, right? Um, and the question then is whether the answer to that question is Fanny's paper, right? And precisely the kind of openness to indeterminacy to an extended duration, so does she give the answer um, to thinking about that? And then for Fanny, I wanted to ask, sort of thinking about Lucas's paper, right? If we shift from talking about terrorism as one of the huge issues on the, the contemporary agenda to thinking about climate change and climate catastrophes, does that look different? And I guess part of what I'm thinking about is part of the piece is, that, I mean, part of the contribution is indeterminacy also about duration, where part of the discussion around climate change is that there's actually not very much time to act before certain kinds of changes are irreversible. And that the sense of, oh, well, we don't need to act now, or we don't know how long this is going to take is indeterminate often functions for conservative responses that in fact we don't actually need to do anything right, right now and we shouldn't take other kinds of risks to kind of grow through that. So. Uh, maybe I'll start. So first, thank you for that um, question. Uh, it's a difficult question. I'm not sure how to answer it actually. But um, it, I think you're right. Um, so I think you're right to detect um, a note of pessimism in my in my paper, and I think that's um, um, diagnostic of something. I mean, I, I I'm quite pessimistic actually. Um, um, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, so one thing that concerns me about so I'm not sure that there that um, I. I certainly do feel a, a, a sense of pessimism. I don't know if resignation is quite right because I, I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that what we should do is stop trying to um, change things, right? Rather, what I'm suggesting is that uh, we, in our effort to change the world around us, which includes one another, right, uh, that, we, that we do so uh, cognizant of the limits of our ability to do so, right? Does that mean, but, should we give up hope that we can make a difference? Maybe that yeah, yeah. Be a way to so I don't think so, but but I um, I'm not sure why um, why the kind of humility I'm advocating precludes hope, right? But uh, but but I, well, I want to say something quickly about grace. So one thing I worry about with um, bringing the language of theodicy into it is that it sounds like what we're looking, the hope that we're looking to, to is somehow external, right? It's something um, outside of our everyday interactions with one another. 
And that's something I would want to resist, right? I would want to say that um, what we should look to is not something that's outside of our everyday lives, but rather um, very much what our everyday lives constitute, but that, but that it should include things other than what we recognize as um, things that are similar to ourselves. Um, so, th but I don't want to, but I don't want to, uh, I don't think it's necessary, like, I don't think that it follows from the kind of humility that I'm advocating that we shouldn't have hope, but I think it does follow that um, there's a kind of temperance of, of hope, right? Because I do think it's true that, um, um, that we need to, that what I'm arguing for is a recogni recognition of limits, right? And so that, that is a recognition of, of um, what cannot be done as well as what can be done. But that's not to say that nothing can be done, right? Thanks, Hal, for those questions. Uh, in, in a funny way, I think the two questions are, are versions of a concern about quietism in both projects. Um, since both projects have, a, have an element of self-limitation or withdrawal, and in your question to Lucas, you're sort of asking about the quietism of limit, limiting your personal power and in relation to mine about time, but I actually think the problem with time becomes a question of when you exert your personal power in the way you're describing. So the, the conservative response, or the often conservative response, lots of people I think make it on, on all sides, that um, we just don't have to do anything yet, that basically this is, we have, we have enough time, or we shouldn't be so worried about impending doom, or things like that. Um, I think it's often a, a way of saying, I am going to exert my power, I'm just going to do it later, um, when, I, when I feel like it more. So I am going to exert my power to, for instance, um, practice a complex form of self-limitation that's going to have significant consequences for the way I live. Um, and that's going to be a practice um, that I have to engage in pretty seriously and strenuously. But I'm just going to do that, do that later. Um, it's almost like a form of procrastination. And I think, that, I think that that kind of procrastination has a lot to do with um, misunderstanding duration and, and thinking that, uh, but, but in exactly the opposite way, I think, than the way that you asked, which is to say that I think Procrastination happens in relation to a deadline, and so there's a sense that if the problem is something that has a specific period, then I can do it later because the ending, the end time when I need to have determined something, is still far enough away. But if we think about indeterminacy as this ongoing temporality that never has these kind of discretized units in such a strong sense, then I think actually you generate a kind of urgency um, because you don't have that ability to wait um, until when the deadline arrives. I'll stop it. Um, I also thought these two papers worked beautifully together, actually, and thank you both for them. I have more of my questions for Lucas, but I'll just um, ask you one question, Anna. Anna, I just wondered whether you could give us a very concrete example in, in non-theoretical terms of how your recipe for avoiding the problems of the, you know, the Hobbesian response to terrorism or the care response to horrorism how in the, this emphasis on negotiation um, and living with the other, how would that play out? Or how, how can you see that as playing out, say, in the context of Syria today? All right, so that's my question to you. Um, my qu I have a number of things to say to you, Lucas. One is that um, uh, this is just, a, uh, I guess, a small question or a small, small point. So, somewhere in your paper, you seem to suggest that when things are, um, to, to, to put things in nature, you know, to take things out of civil society and to put them in nature, that happens when we decide, or that when the courts decide that something can't be owned, right? So a DNA sequence, when you know, the courts decide that's not ownable, that means that essentially that's, they recognize that that belongs in the category of nature. And when something is patentable, that then t is, that, um, signifies that that thing has been taken into civil society. And I wonder there whether you're conflating um, what counts as being part of culture or civil society with private property, private property. I mean, you know, that, is that what to you is the kind of, is that the condition that makes something um, culture rather than nature? And, and which I think that would be a mistake, but that's a small point, but. And I guess my bigger point to you is um, 
that a, a biology a colleague of mine once said that the problem with the human species is not, it, or what makes it distinctive is not that it wrecks its habitat. She says, actually, many, many species wreck their habitats, but that it travels. This human species has learned how to travel, so it goes everywhere, and therefore it's much more dangerous to other species than other species are, you know, whose, whose, whose effects are more local. Um, I, I think that um, I really like what you're doing in wanting to kind of, um, to, to say that we have a sort of crisis of the imagination and that we have to begin to see ourselves as, you know, having is as limited and having uh, ha having a much more humble sense of ourselves. And I would like to, I mean, I, I really go with you. I mean, I agree with you with that. Um, I see the opposite kind of self-imagination, which I think is highly problematic, as the imagination of the self as a sovereign self. And I think it's whether it's a, you know, a sovereign people or a sovereign individual or a sovereign species in this case. The idea of the self as being someone, or a species in this case, that can command without the consent of those that are being commanded and be able to also have sovereign power over the, the, the responses of those selves to one's attempt to command them so that when you know, the idea is that you can always control, I mean, in the way that Anu is actually describing, you can always control um, uh, whatever someone out, who has a different will or uh, a different um, instinct, how they might come at you once you've commanded them. That, the, that idea uh, or ideal is, to me, at the heart of the ideal of sovereign power. And I think that it's a very dangerous um, delusion in this case, because the human species thinks that we can, you know, always um, control the reaction of our actions. And in this case, not on the part of other people, but on the part of things that are, of, you know, different forces and species. And, and it's that conception that really is at the heart of our problem, I think. Uh, and it would have to be shifted so that we um, don't keep ratcheting up the, uh, the, the sort of... Um, uh, crisis that we're creating through acting the way we are with respect to nature. I mean, the idea that we could then shield, you know, do shields out there to, you know, and you can just see then the natural responses to that, that we then try to control and the whole thing begins to, I mean, that we get, it's at, we're out of control. But, so I, I really like that and I, again, see the kind of sovereign self as the opposite notion of the self that you're trying to displace, I think. Um, I guess I, I wonder whether, you know, I mean, this is, you're asking for a shift in the imagination, but I wonder about the, and maybe this is where your pessimism comes in, you know, what are the kind of material conditions for that shift? In other words, what, what's preventing us from thinking in that much more humble way about who we are? And how would you suggest that we deal with that? that, the, the obstacles to that kind of shift in the imagination. I'm sorry, it's a bit long-winded, but. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a great deal to say. Um, I mean, your question, so thanks for your question, it's fascinating. Um, but yeah, there's a lot going on, so I'll try to um, pick out a few things to talk about. So um, the, the note that you end on, so um, I think, um, part of my concern, so I think describing it as a failure of the imagination is, is very apt. Um, and I wonder whether, so the kind of thinking I'm sort of advocating is one that embed, I, I like your language a lot of, um, so I was thinking about, well, how might we describe the opposite of the sovereign self, right? And maybe a, a kind of language that I would advocate is something like an embedded self or something like that, right? Uh, uh, or an enmeshed self or something of that sort, where the embeddedness is, is not just within civil society, but within a much broader, maybe for lack of a better term, ecological context. Uh, one concern is that it's, it's, um, there is still something, uh, I suspect uh, there is still a kind of human uniqueness there because um, I, I don't expect that other organisms within, within which we share um, the, this enmeshed existence um, um, 
uh, sh share the concern about enmeshment that, that I'm articulating, right? So I, so I don't know if I can ever, I mean, I, you know, th there is a kind of an asymmetry that I think is going to persist. But um, part of what, and this is a kind of subtext, I think, of the paper that isn't um, explicitly articulated, but part of what is motivating me is, so I'm a historian of science, and um, uh, part of what's motivating the, this work is a kind of more a broader um, dissatisfaction with uh, an epistemology that I see not just uh, in science studies, but kind of in the humanities much more broadly with a kind of constructivist epistemology. Much of, uh, w which comes from a place that I deeply sympathize with, but, a, but I have a kind of concern that a lot of this, a lot of the kind of constructivist epistemology that I, that I myself and so many of my colleagues um, uh, uh, subscribe to um, sort of privileges the role of the human and in particular the role of the human mind, right? That uh, if the world, if, if a, kind, a kind of canonical or a kind of unreflective idealism is the height of human arrogance, right? And so part of what I'm trying to suggest is that we need to develop not just a, a way of imagining, but also a way, a, 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 not just a new imaginative practice, but also a new kind of ep epistemic practice, right? Um, so. And just, just very quickly, so the, the issue of travel and scope, I agree that human beings, um, you know, we, we're quite numerous, although certainly not, I think in terms of biomass, probably not, um, as uh, certainly there's other organisms that occupy um, more uh, space and, and uh, uh, in, in, on Earth. Uh, but yeah, we do, I, I do think there are things that make human beings special in some ways, right? But I think that we can say that for other organisms too, right? Um, and it's just that we happen to focus on the things that make us special uh, because that's what we are, right? But I think I, I chose the example that I, that I mentioned in the paper, which is cyanobacteria, very deliberately because that's a, a, an intervention that's on the same scale as anthropocentric climate change, right? The, 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 the atmosphere that we're, worrying, that we're curr currently so worried about destroying is an atmosphere that was created by other organisms, right? Um, which isn't to say that therefore we should stop worrying about it and just say, oh well, it's all biology and things change and there's you know um, evolution happens and and you know the world keeps on spinning. But it's just to say that um, I don't think that, that there are mo there are sort of aspects of of our species that make us unique, but I don't think they're fundamental, right? I think there's aspects to others that make other species unique as well, and and uh, I think the trick is to try to um, come to grips with what those are rather than to emphasize any particular uh, uniqueness. And briefly to Syria, um, the, there's, a, there's a very concrete example that seems as if it's trivializing the situation, so I'm going to give it, but with that disclaimer. Um, there is a, an initiative right now by um, IKEA, the Swedish furnishing company, um, to create um, shelters for Syrian refugees, particularly who are still in the Syria region. Um, and it's the first initiative to create shelters in refugee camps that has ever had a team that included architects, not just focus groups, but architects who are from that climate and from that country and among the refugees. And I think that it's an interesting example of negotiation because part of what that does is say that the people care is for, the people who are the vulnerable are people who should have opportunities for recourse for how they're cared for, have opportunities to be a part of the caring and have a kind of fluidity in the response um, while simultaneously in the position of the paradigmatic, unilaterally vulnerable, um, you know, if not the infant, the refugee in that context. And so I think um, the example occurs to me more than others um, because of the, my surprise on reading it that there's never been a team before that included um, people from the country of origin on the design team, and I found that rather, rather interesting. So I think negotiation looks like um, being able to, having the cared for be able to talk back, but also not just back, but from the start. Alex. Okay, uh, thanks. These were both great papers uh, and a lot of questions, but I'll just ask one to each person. For Fanny, uh, at some point I started thinking of this old New Yorker cartoon where it shows two senators walking and one says to the other, my instinct is to do the cowardly thing, but I don't know what it is. 
<laughs> and uh, the, the reason popped in mind was the problem of unknowability and its relationship to indeterminacy because in Hobbes, the, 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 the slave nature is an epistemic condition. The problem is even if everybody basically morally agrees uh, that everyone has a right to self-preservation, nature is inscrutable, nature is unknowable. There's nothing about nature that guarantees we're all gonna have the same impressions about what the facts of the matter are. And for that reason and that reason alone, we have no reason to agree about, for instance, what's gonna count as a threat, and so we're all gonna be at war. And the function of the sovereign is to provide the epistemic guarantees about the behavior of other people by defining all the terms and, and uh, you know, weights, measures, what counts as a life, so on and through its coercive force, guaranteeing that everybody agrees that that's what things mean. But what that means is, at least in the Hobbesian view, uh, for people to enjoy the freedom that they do, you need to have a lot of determinacy. I mean, the point of sovereign authority is to de determine everything and to provide guarantees about those determinations. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I, I'm sort of wondering but the dialectic of determinacy and freedom there is that it's precisely the determinate character of sovereign authority and the world that people inhabit that allows them then to live free lives and enjoy all this liberty instead of having their liberty determined for them by just the environment. So it's actually redetermining the environment that allows indeterminacy to develop. And so I was sort of, but this is also a reason why one might be what negotiation. Right, because it's, it's, it's the whole point is, it's not clear why we could get the same thing through negotiation. For Lucas, um, this is sort of, I, I would, I guess I heard you saying, there were two possible ways of interpreting what you were saying about, well, I'm sure there were a million, but for me, there were two possible ways of interpreting what you meant by uh, coming face to face with our limits, the limits of, of human power. And I think I wanna dissent strongly from what seemed to be the dominant thrust of your argument, but agree with what could have been the kind of minority or, or leitmotif interpretation. So the dominant one seemed to me to be just the old Malthusian line, that there are natural limits to human aspirations, and they're inscribed in laws of nature. It's actually older than Malthus originally. It's in the laws of nature, both as sort of causal relationships, but also moral principles that impose themselves on on, on human beings because they're designed by God. But Malthus is the one who really turns it into a principle of political economy in which nature, there are periodic natural crises, famine, famines, wars, sort of mass dying off, that reimpose themselves any time human beings try to surpass those, those natural limits. And that's a recurring argument. Uh, it becomes the, the, the essence of crisis theory uh, um, and, and an attempt to kind of naturalize crises. Uh, and it seems to me a standard kind of left-wing argument has always been to resist this attempt to naturalize what are contingent features of a particular kind of political economy. I mean, Marx accuses Ricardo, when Ricardo gives his account of crises, of descending into organochemistry, when in fact what he's talking about are the crisis tendency of capitalism. But the problem is if you take the Malthusian line, then what you're doing is naturalizing contingent features that are actually under our control. They're contingent features because they're a function of our social and political relationship. They're not actually laws of nature. Although there's something about this society that legitimates itself by making it just seem natural and uncorrectable. So you're, but your dominant, the sort of, the, the main tendency of your argument about our experience of limits seem to be just to embrace this as just a re, the kind of Malthusian position. Ah, we, you know, we shouldn't aspire to have so much control. We first need to recognize we can't control as much as we really can. But there were a couple moments at the beginning or at the end when you suggested that, well, in fact, this is just a social and political problem. We don't have the, at the moment, the institutions don't exist in the global level to make the, the so, kinds of collective decisions we need to make. And so what we need instead is a kind of social and political transformation so that we could in fact act to exercise the kinds of control over our social environment, not just our natural one, to, to resolve some of these issues. Um, but then we, we'd actually be having to talk about exercising more power than we currently do, right? About, we'd have to imagine the ability to act democratically and collectively at a national, international scale, which is precisely the kind of argument I think Malthus, I mean Malthus very clearly was a counter-revolutionary, mobilized all of these arguments for this purpose, and they recur 
periodically in the 19th century precisely to defeat that kind of collective democratic form of agency. So, uh, and that was a little bit there, but it seemed to undercut the wider was sort of political and resignation that seemed to dominate your way of, of suggesting we think about the limits of our power. Thanks. Um, my my short answer is is yes. I think I, I agree entirely. Um, but I think that the the epistemic uncertainty is critical to me. But I don't think you need the the sovereign to decide it. So specifically in the move that Hobbes is making and saying that we need to be able to have that sort of decision so that there we we are not in that state of unknowing. Um, I think can be done on social practical accounts that are defined through forms of negotiation. I'm not talking about deliberative democracy here, but something more agonistic. So in saying something like that, I think that what I'm trying to say, though I'm still working this out, is that the Hobbesian account of indeterminacy is a better grounding of something like the sociopractical account of how politics could work agonistically um, than people have made it out to be. Precisely because when people have um, criticize Hobbes, and I'm thinking particularly of Cabrera as well as some other feminist inheritors of, um, of this form of critique against the sovereign subject, what they've done is try to do this move of reversing the, the form of determination. So agreeing that you need determinacy, um, which in some ways I agree with too on the social practical account, agreeing that you need determinacy and then saying um, it should be the caregiver who determines as opposed to some anybody else, um, as opposed to a sovereign or something along those lines. And I think that what that does is just thin the account um, and make the same mistake over again and actually make it worse in some ways um, and, um, and cause all sorts of problems in that sense. So what I was saying about Hobbes toward the end was specifically aimed at those sorts of concerns. So I, I agree completely. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, excellent question, Alex. Um, so I think um, part of, so, um, I'm trying to think about how best to answer it. But so I think part of what you're identifying is the kind of what, I, what in the paper I describe as the sort of broadly conservative thrust of um, the concept of nature, right? So that to, to say, um, right, so in the paper I, I use the example of Adam Smith, for example, right, who says, well, we just have like an, we have an innate tendency to truck, barter, and exchange. And that's why we need to make the, the um, and that's why the marketplace should be at the center um, uh, of, of human society. Uh, so I certainly share with you the, um, I'm very suspicious of those kinds of moves as well. So, um, and I, um, um, it's, it's unfortunate if, if, the, if I gave the impression that, that I want to embrace uh, um, that kind of politics, right? A kind of a politics that, that, that seeks to naturalize uh, what you, I think, very aptly described as contingent features of our political economy. So um, maybe uh, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is kind of um, emphasize that I do mean for this to be a kind of constructivist metaphysics, right? So I don't want to say that things just, right, th things just, um, there are certain things that are just natural, and that means they are what they are, and we shouldn't, uh, uh, we shouldn't, um, um, uh, make attempts uh, to uh, intervene in them in some ways, right? Rather, the claim is that um, what we experience is, as uh, part of nature or part of civil society is um, in some ways a kind of construction of our culture and civil society itself, right? So as, as our culture changes, in particular, I'm thinking of um, uh, um, the, right, the history of science and technology, uh, what we understand to be our experience of the natural changes, right? So there is no kind of essential fact of the matter about what is natural and what is not natural, right? So there is meant to be a sort of uh, um, what you might describe as a kind of uh, skeptical constructivism that kind of underlies, that sort of informs the ontology of the project. And, and I share that with, you know, people like Bruno Latour and many, many others um, who work in this vein. Um, but the intervention I'm trying to make is not to say that we should abandon that constructivism, rather it's to say that uh, uh, we should uh, um, kind of have a modest uh, constructivism, right? A constructivism that, that doesn't kind of celebrate uh, humanity's uh, uh, kind of chosen status in the world or something like that, but rather a kind of constructivism that, that downplays our own importance or that kind of, that, um, uh, so, you know, 
so I really mean for it to be, I, I really like um, Joan's suggestion of thinking of, it, thinking of the project as a kind of training of the imagination or a kind of practice of the imagination, right? So uh, the, the, the metaphysics and the ontology is broadly, you might say broadly sort of Latourian or broadly constructivist, uh, but the kind of register in which I want to um, uh, think through that constructivism is quite different. It's a much more modest sort of register, a much more sort of reserved kind of register. register. So we have a determinant amount of time and a determinately large number of people still in the queue, so I'll ask both questioners and responders to be as concise as possible. And Vizier. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed what the papers have just been said, and I thought of them as sort of putting forward a problem with history. Periodization of time, which is what historians do as providing the limits and meaning time, and I thought of what repetition is something that both periodization and, and imagination and repetition um, are mobilized to. Uh, um, understand and become um, and, and, and counter in predominance this attempts to periodize time and, and understanding repetition in particular when you uh, want to determine a set of actions uh, because you have uh, this, this notion that this, is, this happened before and now now we can act. Um, so I was thinking of both of you sort of speaking in terms of a problem of history. And I wanted to say uh, natural history as um, which I, you know, if you can take something to say about natural history as a kind of timelessness, um, a form of classification which was written for a kind of timelessness. And when I think about humanity, um, in another sort of way. And yeah, I was thinking of a life on the Gita uh, where um, um, the gods, Krishna says to Arjuna um, as they are about, uh, he's about to decide to go into battle. Um, and and uh, Krishna says, you must act, uh, but you must act without seeking the fruits of your action. And, I, and, and, and it's been interpreted in many ways to think of it as an imperative to act without uh, the determinacy, without having a determined outcome. Um, so just because the future is unknown or unknowable or indeterminate does not, um, does not mean it's a different sort of conception of action and the result of Well, thanks. I, I will repeat um, what I said earlier that I think, I do think that indeterminacy creates urgency. Um, poss I, the way you're describing is fascinating. I would love to learn more about that. Um, the way I often think of it is not in terms of not having ends in mind, but in knowing that your, your pursuit of them will probably occur differently. Um, and that makes it even more important to begin, to begin acting now. But I'll, I'll, stop there. <laughs> uh, I'll also I'll try to be brief as I've been instructed to do. Um, um, so the um, so I, I'm very interested in I mean as you know I'm very interested in natural history and in, including the history of natural history. Um, uh, I, I'm I think you're right that there's uh, in in the history of natural history there's been a kind of tendency um, um, to think of natural history as something which is timeless. Uh, in the sense that, so there's almost a kind of sense in which natural history is ahistorical, right? Uh, so um, natural history doesn't have a history uh, in the sense that, um, th you know, there's, there's structures, there's relationships, but there isn't really change over time. And that's something that I think the, the view that I'm trying to develop um, actively tries to push against, right? To say that, um, and this kind of gets at some of, it's unfortunate Alex is, is not here at the moment, but this gets at some of Alex's question as well. That, um, when I talk about this being a kind of constructivist project, I mean that in a kind of very um, um, sort of almost simplistic kind of materialist sense. So when I talk about constructivism, I, part of what I mean is just that, you know, we, we, we literally build the world around us in, in kind of very concrete ways, right? We, we build cities, we build roads, 
uh, we have agriculture, right? We, we exert selection pressures on other species through domestication and so on and so forth, but so do other, so do other um, par parts of the world, right? That, um, that the world is built, it's not that the world is kind of given to us. The world is built by us and by everything else that, that we co-inhabit the world with. And so it changes tremendously over time, right? So evolution is not this, uh, this is what the um, uh, students of Dick Lewinton who developed this theory of niche construction, that's what they're talking about when they say that it's niche construction, right? It's not the kind of dominant way of thinking about evolution is that, well, you have an ecology and the ecology exerts selection pressures on organisms and it's those selection pressures that then shape the organisms. So the organisms just adapt to the world around them. The whole point of this niche constructionist way of thinking is to think in terms of feedback loops, right? That the organisms shape the environments which then in turn shape them and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's the kind of, um, that's, so when I talk about constructivism, um, I, talk, I, I mean it in that very kind of simplistic sort of material sense, um, but I think it, one of the consequences is that it gives a history to natural history because kind of contingent events along the way um, have, have determinate outcomes, right? Or not determined, but have, like, have yeah. consequences. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they're determinate actually, I guess, is a difficult empirical question. <laughs> But have consequences, right? So that so that it it um, there's a kind of path dependency um, uh, to the process. Okay, we only have about ten minutes left, so I'd like to at, at least get the questions out so that that our uh, respondents can hear them. So I'm just going to collect the remaining questions. If you could just quickly state your question, and if there's time at the end, we'll let we'll let them select uh, what they can to respond to. James, is that right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll ask, I'll ask my questions after the, the session. Okay. Suzanne. Um, just, yeah, really quickly. I mean, it's actually amazing how all of the papers so far given have worked so well together, which leads me to believe that the organizers of the conference possess <laughs> us. We, 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 <laughs> before we, we had written the papers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> hopefully we won't disappoint. So, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> But uh, so, I, um, so my question actually to both of you is ha has to do with how you are um, uh, mobilizing the concept of concept here. Mm -hmm. And I was very struck by um, the opening of Lucas's your paper, where you say you you know that concept as a um, is used as a kind of powerful tool as a way of intervening and that you would like to think about a concept of nature that is more, what well, you say later, you know, in the, now in the Q&A, embedded, but more fragile, et cetera. And so, um, so I, my, you know, I would just like to know what you would think, a con you know, whether you're thinking a, that the concept would have to change in order to make that possible, right? The concept of concept? The or? concept of concept vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the question of nature, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, and Fanny, uh, so I was very struck in, in, in your case that um, you invoke two, two kinds of text, uh, um, a performance and, and then political theory. And, um, and, and so I'm wondering how you would, um, um, how you would put these, things, these two things together. And in other words, I mean, it's partly, I guess, the performative aspect of theory, possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, or something else. Right? And so in other words, would we have to think about the notion of concept in different ways in order for determinacy to work? Thanks. Rebecca. Oh, I'm so much more interested in hearing their answer to your question no, than my question, but I'll just try to go quick. <laughs> um, so, I mean, look, thank you. Fantastic. So much more to, to talk about, Lucas. I, I was interested in your saying uh, the dominant narrative of the Anthropocene is written in this form or the genre. I don't, didn't catch the word of tragedy. But then I was kind of stumbling on the idea of thinking, thinking as, as you went on, talking about tragedy as being, at least in this classical formation, the sort of drama of someone, an individual who has to be humbled, right? Who has to actually face and then mm -hmm. begin to deploy mm -hmm. humility. Mm -hmm. So that your suggestion of sort of taking on humility isn't really, is it, outside of a tragic form? And mm -hmm. is that a tragedy or whatever mm -hmm. in your 
I don't know what to do about that. But then also the tragedy has in its classical form contained within it this idea of determinacy, that the problem of, you know, of, of the humility is, the, is facing that everything is already determined. So maybe what you're talking about is between these two papers is something about not a, a humility in the face of indeterminacy rather than in the tragic sense, a humility in the face of determination. Mm -hmm. And what would that humility in the face of indeterminacy be and what is a tragedy relative to that? But then I started to think about tragedy as this... Uh, you know, arch humanist form, and its other is not comedy, of course, although it could be, but there's nothing very funny about climate change, and nor would anyone suggest that that should be a form we take on relative, well, maybe, anyway, is that, is I was thinking with Michael Tausig on the idea of shamanism as opposed to tragedy, shamanism versus tragedy, which brings us back to the sort of possession question mm -hmm. in a really interesting way, mm -hmm. and the problem of the sort of re-emergent, you know, primitive or primitivism, so, I have more to say, but thank you for, for making me form that question, because um, I'm indebted in, in a humble way. <laughs> <laughs> Tim. James. Thank you. Um, first and smallest, uh, when we quote Adam Smith, please, could we quote not just that there's a natural propensity to truck and barter, but the rest of the damn sentence, in, in which he talks about, he says, perhaps it's a, a natural propensity, or it may be the result of the human desire to exchange, and, and that's also shown up in speech. Because it does seem that there is, there is something there that he's getting at that's, that, that goes beyond the, um, the, the Heritage Foundation's vision of, of, of Adam Smith. <laughs> Um, he's too good a thinker to lose, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and he should not be left only to the other side. Um, of, of larger and of more, perhaps, significance, I too thought this tied rather nicely in, not only with each other, but with the editorial statement for the um, uh, Political Concepts Project, uh, which talks about political concepts as a way of opening pathways to the future by reinterpreting certain concepts. I am, however, deeply pe pessimistic of the prospect of opening a pathway to a future with a reinterpretation of what it looks like is going to be, and I think it's right to, say, to urge this, a recognition of weakness and a tolerance for indeterminacy. Because I wonder if there's just something that's centrally pathological about politics, that it resists those very notions. Um, when you think about the origins of, of, of the polity laying in the construction of a wall around a city, you know, and, and, then, you know, and, and then trying to figure out how to do with, deal with sewage. Um, it also, I think, is, 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 is routinely going to be the most vilified, at least in this political climate, the most vilified uh, of, of political stances, if we think of, um, as we are working through what I hope is not our Reichstag fire, uh, Chris Christie announcing that at the moment this, the, the San Bernardino attacks took place, he knew it was terrorism, as opposed to a president who would waffle before saying the word. Um, the quote from Hobbes that you want to use doesn't work for the reasons that Alex pointed out, and they're all in the first sentence. Um, hereby it is manifest, during the time when men live without a common power to keep them in awe, mm -hmm. they are in the condition known as war. Mm -hmm. So politics e e exists in the awful power of the Leviathan, and without that power, we are then in this state, which even though it doesn't look like war, um, is war, because just because it's sunny out there, you know, it, the, the thunderstorm's going to, they're going to come again. And, but, but contra Alex, it's not that the Leviathan gives you a lot of, of, of freedom, because freedom is then reinterpreted uh, in, in ways which, as Quentin Skinner shows, I think, wonderfully in his book on Republican liberty, are just perverse in Hobbes. I mean, it's, it's really a, a war with the entire uh, tradition. But I think the invocation that you had there of natality may be the only possibility uh, in, uh, on our end, as, as being maybe something radically different, which brings in the question of grace, uh, 
uh, because it does seem that in this, and there's a lovely and inexplicable, to, at least to me, passage where she talks, and, and I'm unlocatable because I can't remember where it is right now, where she talks about each birth as being a, a miracle in the same way that the, that, the, that the existence of the human species at all is a miracle, uh, and that therefore politics should be this site of miracles. The last move is the one I'm deeply yeah. pessimistic about its possibility, though. Bill? Uh, yeah, I have a question for Fanny, and I, I, I say in advance, Bill, you might find you this book very abstract and irrelevant to what you're talking about, but it's, a, it's, a, it's something that I, I, it often seems to me that in discussions or debates about determinacy and indeterminacy, at some level, um, the, the discussion itself is conditioned, if not actually determined, by the by the root terminus, mm -hmm. uh, not just in English, but in all the languages that use that. That is, it, 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 it's, it becomes a question of, of endness, you know. And um, this, it, in the work I do, um, this, this matters because some of the work I do has to do with the German vocabulary, which is, is the, the root metaphor is completely different. Bestimmung, bestimmen is all about Stimme. Yes. Yeah. It's about voice. It's about well, Stimme can mean vote. I mean, it, it's a, it's a, It really shifts the discourse from um, questions or assumptions about extent and limit to questions about agency mm -hmm. and power. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did, uh, when you, I mean, Lucas, you may want to have something to say about this too, but don't feel you have to speak about it since I'm bringing it up only because it's my issue. Uh, it's an issue for me. Uh, but, uh, the therapist you, isn't here anymore, though. So <laughs> <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> Adi. <laughs> uh, we, we simply have to leave the building uh, in the evening, so uh, 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 calculate this uh, backward. Uh, so uh, please, uh, we have lunch downstairs, and we shall also have uh, uh, dinner, informal dinner, for everyone who wants to join us uh, in the English cellar just uh, around the corner. Uh, so. Um, you have a minute to respond or to <laughs> give up in humiliation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll respond very quickly. First, uh, to James, yeah. Um, uh, thanks for um, um, correcting me on, on the Adam Smith quote. So I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm not trying to use Adam Smith as a... Um, uh, uh, as a target for my ire or anything like that. It's, 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 it's more just a kind of canonical, right? So naturalizing the marketplace is, uh, so the, in the paper, the citation that I use is, is Polanyi's, um, 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 uh, uh, Carl Polanyi's book, uh, which, which is, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's more to say, it's, it's, it's not meant to be a critique of Smith more so than uh, um, a critique of people who, who I think you're right, misread Smith or sort of read Smith too simply. Uh, very, very quickly, I'll just say um, to s sort of Suzanne and, and maybe Rebecca together. So I do think actually that um, there's an interesting sense maybe in which uh, the kind of story I'm trying to tell might um, have some consequences for how we think about the concept of concept. So I take it to be that one of the motivating, or at least in, for, for, for me, one of the motivating one thing I find very useful about the framework of, of this um, project of political concept is that uh, it, uh, it kind of uh, um, um, it, it implies a certain concepts are things that we use to to do things right, um, and certainly that's how I think of them. Um, and so there's no reason why we can't rethink them. There's no reason why we can't rebuild them. There's no reason why we can't change them. But I do think it's true that in my case it doesn't exactly follow. But I think it's it's sort of um, um, I would like to suggest that we not be too, um, too wedded to our concepts, right? That we can build concepts, uh, and when they s cease to be useful, uh, uh, we can throw them out as well, or we can change them. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't live by them. Um, and very, very quickly, just, uh, um, I, 
maybe tragedy isn't quite the right word. What I'm, what I, again, it's something that didn't make it into the paper, but what I was thinking of, there's, this is actually not the first time that we've talked about the, um, living in a period of the Anthropocene. Uh, about 150 years ago, a little bit less, um, in the history of uh, people thinking about geology, it was very common to divide uh, the Earth into uh, having different stages, the Earth history having different stages, where there's like the age of fishes, the age of reptiles, the age of mammals, and now we're living in the age of man. And that was very much a kind of triumphalist narrative. Um, and one thing that concerns me about the contemporary conversation about the Anthropocene is that in some ways all, it just flips that narrative on its head, right? It just says, ah, yes, now we're living in the age of man, but it's a bad thing, right? <laughs> uh, but, it, but, I could, but I worry that in some ways it actually leaves intact the kind of narrative structure of that older triumphalist narrative and therefore kind of undermines its own political um, thrust. But, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Fanny, you have one minute. Do you want to take a, <laughs> choose one point and uh, give your decisive uh, response? All right, I'll, um, uh, thanks, I guess would be the one point. But um, I, very briefly to James, I think um, that's exactly right. But what I'm interested in in Hobbes there is the fact that he is concerned about this question of duration and the desire to spend indeterminate time with others. And I'm sort of interested in what that does to it. The sense in which then it becomes about natality um, is, to my project at least, a sense in which it becomes very much about grace and the conception of the miracle. Um, the other half of this project, um, and this maybe will answer all of the questions in one, the other half of this project is about Christian traditions of understanding the self-emptying of Christ um, and the incarnation, and that as a form of limitation, humility, the development of vulnerability, very much in conversation with um, what Lucas is doing. Part of what I find productive about that is that it is simultaneously a practice that can be emulated in the world and a conception of making room for grace. And, um, and I think that there's a reason there in a non-theological context to be then highly pessimistic if that's the only way you can get there. Um, but there's also a lot there to be said for how we can try to develop forms of humility, self-limitation, and vulnerability that are, um, that are responsive to indeterminacy and really enact, as Rebecca said, um, humility in the face of indeterminacy in those ways. But there's a longer story to be told. All so. of which Hobbes puts the screws to in parts of the books that no one reads. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So we had one person on the queue that we didn't get to, so make sure to consult with Thongong to get her <laughs> question. Maybe over dinner you can continue the conversation. But thanks to both of you, Fanny and Lucas, for your <laughs>